It's a particularly great pleasure to make this presentation uh, on Reshev's 70th birthday um, celebration. Um, we've been friends for a long time, a great scientist, and uh, we've done some nice work even together. And here is a picture taken by my wife uh, with, of uh, me with the tennis. Um, I'd like um, to say a little bit about the work that we've been carrying out, um, mainly whilst I came here to Florida State um, nearly 10 years ago. Um, basically been working on self-assembly, nanotechnology in fact, and um, uh, the idea that I had when I came here was, um, is it possible that one day we might um, create a computer by bottom-up assembly, okay? nanotechnology by chemistry. Well, it's already been done. In fact, um, our brain is some sort of computing device and we've been created atom by atom, molecule by molecule, protein by protein um, on the basis of DNA blueprints. So it should be possible one day to do the same um, by chemistry. Now, on the basis of that idea, um, the first thing I thought about doing was uh, to try to create a two-dimensional array of uh, metal clusters, in this case nickel clusters, and that was carried out with Prashant Jain, fantastic student, Naresh Dalal and Tony Sheaton. And it was based on the thought that the old ferrite core memories um, really were very interesting, and you could see how they could work, because basically you sent one half the current down one wire, uh, and you sent the other half the current needed to magnetize down the other wire at the same time, and you magnetized the core. And that was a beautiful idea and physically easy to understand. And so the basis of this thought was if you could produce magnetic metal clusters to simulate that, then you could reduce the dimension by 10 to the 7 and uh, in, in one dimension and in two dimension by 10 to the 14. Okay, so it really was quite an interesting possibility. Um, we have made two-dimensional arrays of nickel clusters, they're not magnetic, but it's the first rung of a ladder with perhaps another hundred rungs to go. Here are Prashant, Naresh and Tony. Now, another idea many years ago um, was that um, how did nanotubes form? Uh, particularly the metal catalyzed nanotubes. Um, here we see at the top a electron microscope image where we see a cross section of these. And um, if you look at some of these, you find there are closed off sections. And I thought these were quite interesting and maybe a clue as to how they were formed. Uh, if we look at the central core um, and we look into the electron microscope, what we see is a, uh, a cross section like this. And in some cases, you had these little igloos of carbon. Um, now, my thought was that what was happening was surface reconstruction of a crystalline carbide or some carbide contained. And if that is correct, surface reconstruction might um, lead to the segregation of a graphene sheet which might have that curved structure. So that was an idea quite a long time ago. And then, uh, not long ago, um, Mauricio and Umberto Torones, my friends, um, who were working with Florian Bamhart um, in Darmstadt, uh, sent this to me. They, here's the cross section again, and here we see a rather flat meniscus on the top of the metal, but as it watch it, it uh, under 600 degrees, it changes a little bit more curved, and then a line appears, and then several more lines, and what you're seeing is the birth of a nanotube. This is really beautiful result and if you look at it on a, a, in time lapse here in this film you see exactly what's going on gradually uh, we see the arrival of the nanotubes and the growth and so here is one piece of the jigsaw puzzle how do nanotubes grow in the presence of a metal carpet particle, um, we now know how it happens. And here is a little diagram to show you uh, the beautiful result that Florian in Darmstadt has obtained. Um, Molybdenum sulfide, of course, is Reshevten's big 
beautiful breakthrough. And uh, we've looked at these as well um, with uh, um, the, the Sussex group before I left. Um, here is a picture by Umberto Toronas of the structures and um, we made um, carbon nanotubes which are covered with molybdenum sulfide. They're so essentially um, insulated uh, metal conducting wires and this was done by two great uh, colleagues Ray Whitby and Wen Kwan Su who is, both are now professors one in Sussex and another one in Taiwan. With Reshef, we've looked at uh, some results which indicate that the molybdenum sulfide tubes are really very um, resilient, more resilient than expected, perhaps more resilient than any other material, and we've laid that down to the possibility that because of the uh, intimate sort of structure, um, that you have a bent bond of the sulfur, which is shown here, that maybe is acting like a sort of spring or a shock absorber. And that's a beautiful result, uh, which, as I say, uh, we carried out with Reshev. Now, uh, when I came here, I started working with Alan Marshall, who has created Iron Cyclotron Resonance for Rich Armstrong Max Spectrometry. And we've been looking at the fullerene growth mechanism because it's not well understood. And what we've shown that if you vaporize um, graphite, uh, it will only vaporize at the focus, but it will warm up the rest of the area. And what will happen is that um, the C60 molecules on the surface of the graphite will come off, and they will um, come off in and react with the carbon that is produced from the focus. Only carbon particles, carbon atoms and diamonds etc will be formed from the focus and when they do that we find that we can grow C60 into larger species. This is beautiful work carried out by Paul Duncan, another great uh, work student who's uh, been doing some beautiful work on these sorts of um, mechanisms. Some years ago I, quite a long time ago, I was trying to make C32 and I was playing like this little boy and I was, point out I was just playing and I go back now to something from when I was seven years old. My name was Krotoshina and the teacher wrote to my mother and said, Miss Bowker thinks I would better write and tell you that we are not at all pleased with the way Harold, that's me, has been working during the last few weeks. He is very fond of play. Well, that's what science actually is. Because I was playing, and as I was playing, I came up with this structure, which was not C32. It was C28, and my hair stood on end because I knew we had a very strong signal for C28. And I looked at it very carefully and realized it should be tetravalent, that it should add four hydrogen atoms like this. And that, when it did that, it would release the strain that those carbon atoms that it was, the hydrogen was attached to, and it would still retain the aromatic, the six aromatic rings that were there on the C28. So I thought it should be a, uh, a super atom, behaving almost like uh, sp3 carbon. Then, about five years later, Rick's group uh, got some results on uranium C28, where the uranium which is tetravalent, seems to be quite happy to satisfy the tetravalence from the inside of the cage. Well, we've looked at this again with titanium and zirconium, and also with uranium, and certainly uranium has a remarkable um, sort of empathy uh, for, for C28. In fact, we see a very strong signal for uh, uranium C28 here. In fact, the only thing on the block um, the only fullerene to appear on the block is uranium C28 at early times. So there's something, a fascinating relationship between uranium and carbon. I thought I'd show you some images uh, taken uh, by my wife Margaret uh, when we were last year in Delft. I was sitting at this table and uh, little children would come up and wish to make buckyballs because I had this on there and we had some models. This little boy, I tell you, his tongue never went in. He was totally focused on making a buckyball. His sister wanted to make one too, and she made one. And this little boy as well. But the first customer was this little girl, three years old. And she asked Margaret, um, can she try it? She, she thinks she can do anything. 
So Margaret said, why not? Um, basically, she first had to make 12 red pentagons and then join them up. And I tell you, I've had eight and nine-year-olds who could not do this. And I'll show you this set of photographs. The concentration of making this was just phenomenal as this little girl assembled a buckyball. Now, we knew this had something special, but um, the amazing thing was when we looked at the photographs, the whole set of photographs at the end, what we discovered was this, an amazing last image, uh, just beautiful, the pure joy of creating something yourself and seeing the beauty of what you've created. That is, epitomizes science as much as anything else. Now, and here's Paul Dunk, Chris Henderson, Nathan Kaiser, Nori Shinohara, and Alan Marshall, with whom those, those last uh, endohedral studies were carried out. Um, I'm also involved in education, and I do encourage you to look at my geoset.info gateway site because uh, it, we've got uh, collaborators from all over the world, from Brazil, Japan, Croatia, Spain, UK, USA, and I'm hoping that you will actually build a website to participate in the Geoset program uh, in, in Israel. Now, I'm going to finish off. There are certain bands called the Diffuse Interstellar Bands, and they've been seen since 1919, 1923, and certainly since the 1930s recognized as interstellar material. Here they are, those white lines. Maybe several hundred now have been observed, and none has been identified. Um, and, and that is really strange. We've, we've got millions of molecules, and we've not identified a single one of these lines, and yet they're all over space. Now, here are some images uh, they're well characterized, they're, many of them are very well known and have uh, the puzzle, they've puzzled uh, astronomers and spectroscopists for decades now. Um, well, the third man. When we discovered C60, I thought maybe C60 has something to do with it. Here's C60 molecule, it's been hiding like the third man in the film uh, by, with um, uh, Orson Welles is hiding in the back streets of Vienna. Maybe this molecule has been hiding in the back streets of the galaxy and we didn't know it. And um, this uh, it led me to suggest with my juror the possibility that the bands these, that we've been, uh, been observing, the diffuse interstellar bands, were due to a charge transfer band between, say, sodium or magnesium or potassium, um, common metals maybe that can ionize well, um, and C60. For instance, if we have a complex of this, then maybe on absorption the charge transfers like this, and you'll get a very strong absorption because the charge um, shift should be about five to seven angstroms, which is five to seven times greater than a standard electron shift in a, a, a moiety, a, a, a chromophore, and so should be maybe 25, maybe even 50 times stronger than the average um, uh, uh, sort of absorption coefficient for a, even a strong absorption of a molecule. Well, in outer space, C60, um, maybe it's there. Maybe it was seriously it was there because uh, the carbon chains that we had uh, tried to detect in the original experiment were found in carbon stars, and it was um, to simulate the uh, conditions in the carbon stars that, uh, that I suggested, this, uh, the experiment that led to C60, and uh, then. Um, uh, we found the carbon chains, but we also saw C60 as well. Well, amazingly, 2010, the Spitzer telescope, which is shown here, produced a remarkable spectrum. The white spectrum shown here is that from a star, and the red spectrum shown here is C60, and the blue one is C70. All the bands required are actually there. Isn't that amazing? So here are stars which are pumping out C60 into the interstellar medium. Um, it seems that the carbon stars 
which created the carbon in our bodies, the nitrogen and oxygen, are also producing C60. So once upon a time, before your carbon ended up on the earth, maybe those carbon atoms were once in C60. What an exciting possibility. Now, I thought I'd show you a clip to finish of a Horizon movie. Here is Wolfgang Kretschmer, a great guy, and with his colleagues Don Huffman and Lowell Lamb and Foster uh, Fosteropoulos, uh, extracted C60. It's uh, a BBC Horizon program on C60. <laughs> I believe it is there, and it would be rather nice to feel that, in fact, we were on the right track. There are some interesting features in space. And C60 certainly can fit them better than any other proposal that has been made up to now. I'm a believer, and I think ultimately we'll find that it is there. But others have said that uh, C60 is nothing like a match for the diffuse interstellar balance. They're wrong. <laughs>